Hello, welcome back. It's the Happy Heat Pump podcast again with Bean Beanland and uh, and myself, Evan Davis. I ask the questions, Bean tends to answer them. Today, as we discuss heat pumps, we're going to ask when heat pumps go wrong. It's essentially the episode where we talk about the mistakes to avoid, just a few egregious errors to avoid uh, in installing heat pumps and make sure your installer, if you're putting one in, uh, doesn't... Um, doesn't put it in wrong. So I've got a list here, Bean, of some mistakes that um, people make when putting heat pumps in. Um, mainly the fault of the installer, but we're not talking about installers, we're just talking about the mistakes. Incorrect sizing. That means too big or too small. Talk me through those mistakes and what the consequences are. Yeah, so the starting point is we have to understand the building. So we need some heat loss calculations. Heat loss calculations are made up of two elements, largely. There's fabric, what we'll call fabric losses, so losses through windows, walls, ceilings, what have you. And then we have ventilation losses, which are what they sound like. So you know, if you've got an open fireplace, for example, you've got a lot of ventilation losses up through the chimney. Draft, so leaky windows and what have you. It's not losing heat through the glass now. This is now draft. So two elements. If you have a reasonable handle on the U value, which is how we measure the thermal properties of the fabric, you can get a pretty good handle on what the fabric losses are. The ventilation losses are much, much more difficult to judge. And some of it depends on lifestyle. So if you've got a household where they've got six Labradors, the doors are going to be opening and closing a lot. There's a lot of ventilation losses. Right. Uh, that's an extreme example, of course, but you know what I mean. So the, ha the, the key is to try and get the heat losses as accurate as you can. Let's assume that we've done a good job on the heat losses. Okay. Okay. And they can be measured. So you, you can you know, physically seal up a house, put in, you, know, you do air testing, air tightness testing, for example. So things like that can be done. Let's assume we've done a good job of the heat losses. We then need to try and match the output of the heat pump to the heat losses. Well, and the size of the property, the size of the, the, well, the heat loss, the of air, the, the, the heat air that you're wanting to. The heat loss tells you what size device you need. So the heat losses will come out, and let's say it's a 10 kilowatt heat loss. So you need a heat pump that can deliver at least 10 kilowatts when it's minus five outside or whatever design temperature is. Okay, so. Clearly, if it's undersized, it's under, undersized, and it just means you'll never be able to get the building up to temperature. And this isn't, this isn't a heat pump problem. This is a heating system problem. It doesn't matter what the source is. If it's undersized, it's undersized. If it's oversized... This is the thing. If it, what's wrong with oversized? Could, it, like, I want to be able to get it really warm. I, I, I'd okay. like it to be oversized. It gets a little bit technical at this point. Okay. If it's oversized and it's running at a fixed speed... Yeah. It'll go on, off, on, off, on, off, what we would call short cycling. That is bad news for efficiency. It's also bad news because most compressors are rated by the number of starts. They have a, so life. a lifetime is rated in the number of starts. Um, and clearly, if it's going on and off, you know, far too often, you're going to shorten the life of the compressor. So I just did the really important thing is that if it's oversized, it will tend to be flipping on and off more often. Now, I don't, well, I don't quite and, understand why. Hang on, but not as simple as that. So if when compressors were all fixed speed, so they're, up, they're, they're running at full throttle or they're off. Yeah. So fixed speed compressors, then it was on, off. There are ways of managing how often it turns on and off, you understand. Um, now, most compressors are variable speed in the same way that most circulation pumps are now variable speed, which means that they can respond to the demands of the building. So a building that's 10 kilowatts at minus five will only be five kilowatts at plus two or whatever. Yes, because you're not always heating yes, you, the coldest. Yeah. Days. No. So, so to that extent, all heat pumps that are correctly sized are technically oversized for most of the heating season. Yeah. So you have to have ways of managing that. And that's usually managed by ensuring that you've got enough volume in the system. And that's volume in the radiators, underfloor heating, 
uh, in order to ensure that the heat pump can run long enough before it shuts itself off so that it's not starting more often than we used to aim. When I was an installer, we would aim for three starts an hour tops. Now, that was mainly with fixed speed compressors. With variable speed compressors, you can ramp up and ramp down. So, but the but starts the, is less than issue. The oversizing thing, I think, is an interesting debate that we need to have because we can manage oversizing. I think that technically we can manage oversizing by ensuring we've got enough volume. The debate that I think we need to have is about what serves the consumer best. If you've got a house with a 20, 30 kilowatt gas boiler and it's only a 10 kilowatt house and you convert your integral garage into a playroom or you extend up into the loft or you stick a conservatory on the back, none of those things will trigger the requirement for a bigger boiler. But if we've been really tight in the sizing of the heat pump, potentially we could say, oh, the heat pump's now undersized. So we've got to ask ourselves, I think, what serves the consumer best? Because I believe that technically we can manage oversizing. So I'm not suggesting that we should have the sort of extremes that we have with combi boilers, where you've got a 35 kilowatt unit on a seven or eight kilowatt house, but a little bit of oversizing so that you've got some flexibility as the consumer, I don't think is a bad thing. Some people may want to disagree with me. I like it warm. Do I need to oversize? No, you don't need to oversize. You need to make clear to the installer what you want in your home. And this, again, I think is important to recognize. We have an aging population. They're more sedentary, older people. They tend to want warmer houses. So we are seeing developments now aimed at 55 plus and above. Uh, and I think that there we've got to be very careful because I have seen plenty of examples of people buying those properties trying to get to 23 degrees and they can't because the heat pumps have been tightly sized at 21 degrees target temperature. So again, it's a really interesting that we, it's an interesting point I think that we need to understand not only the building, we've got to understand the lifestyle and the aspiration of the people who are going to be occupying it and then potentially think about a bit of flexibility. Yeah. But if you are, if you do like it warmer than most people, you would want to be on you, the yeah. bigger heat. You would, you know, you'd bigger space. Exactly, because yeah. your heat loss would be yeah. higher. Because the heat loss is set against a set of design temperatures, design outside and design inside. So, no, that seems so, so sizing, yeah. size, sizing is everything. Next error. This is actually not my list, Bean. I have to, I have to, I got some help. Incorrect refrigerant charge. I'll tell you what that is, and then you can explain it. Too much or too little refrigerant can cause poor performance and increase wear and tear. Yeah, so look, domestic yeah. size heat pumps and large charge will mean the volume of the volume of refrigerant yeah. in the system. Yeah, and, and yeah, this podcast is aimed at domestic installations. So most domestic heat pumps, ground source or rare source, are monoblock a single unit, the systems that have the refrigerant in them are hermetically sealed in the factory. So the charge is the charge and it's put in there at the factory. So the chance of it being either under or overcharged actually is very, very low unless you've got a leak. Clearly, if you've got a leak, you're going to lose that refrigerant and you'll end up with, with insufficient refrigerant to be able to operate the machine properly. But for most domestic machines in the UK, over or under charging is unlikely to be a problem. Because you're just buying it pre-charged. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and is that most heat pump installers are not FGAS certified, so they can't actually work on the refrigerant circuit anyway. Okay. Next, location of the external unit must protect airflow in and out. Correct. Yeah. So the really important. Sorry, I, I should phrase it as a mistake. Locating the external unit in a way that doesn't protect airflow yeah, and out. absolutely. Yeah. This is really critical. You've got to make sure that you've got enough space. Most of the monoblocks are what we call through and through. So the air comes in at the back and goes out at the front. You've got to have enough room at the back so that you've got good airflow coming in. You can, you can draw in that air uh, when you need it. And then at the front, what you're putting out is cold exhaust because mm -hmm. you've taken some temperature out of the air. You need to be able to dissipate that cold exhaust. The worst thing is that it hits a solid brick wall, 
bounces back and gets sucked by the machine again. And I have seen instances where that exactly thing. This is a happen. really crucial one. So putting it to be able to dissipate that cold air. So you can't build a big wooden box around your ugly heat pump because then it won't flow as well, can you? You can build covers. There are companies that make covers for heat pumps, but they are specifically designed to ensure that they haven't impeded the airflow to the point where you've got a problem. That's really, really crucial. But the most important thing is being able to vent the cold air successfully and get it away from the vicinity yeah. of the machine. Because as soon as you start sucking your own cold air, you are on the rocky road to ruin. Got another one. Wrong kind of ground source heat pump. Now, we, we talked about this before. You can go for ground source heat pumps. You can dig very deep, basically, to get warmth out of the deep ground. Or you can have a nice network of pipes, much less deep, dig up, go, probably more a meter down, not even a meter. Yeah, we're, we're around about a meter. We're usually around about a meter down. If you put the flat one yep. in non-draining, horizontal, in non-draining soil, it won't function well. So the key here, as with everything else <laughs> around heat pumps, is about size. It's about to sizing again. So. You've got to understand the building, the amount of energy you're going to need, and that will tell you the amount of energy you're going to be taking from the ground. Okay, because your ground energy is sort of, it's not quite finite, but it's more finite than air. I mean, the air, you know, you just keep circulating the air, you're going to get more and more energy out. Um, with ground, you have put a defined collector in the ground, whether it's horizontal or drilled vertical. So the critical element in addition to understanding the building, you've now got to understand the soil conditions or the deep geology conditions, so thermal geological conditions. Uh, so there is a critical further step for ground source where the installer, either because they've got the experience and the ability themselves, or they bring in suitable consulting experience from a hydrogeological -geo designer um, to determine what the soil conditions are like, uh, and or the geological conditions. Uh, so you make sure that you can take the amount of heat you need without depleting the ground temperature from season to season. And draining soils will tolerate more than non-draining soils, mm. I believe. No? No, no, actually. If you put, if you put uh, a, collector, a horizontal collector into bone-dry chalk, Chalk is very dry, bone dry, and so doesn't actually, the, the thermal conductivity is very low. So you need more pipe in the ground. If you put the pipe into a redundant watercress bed or on a natural floodplain where you've got lots of water flowing through, that is a really efficient. Now that's where I have to have it. So, so free draining, yeah, sorry. I mean, dry chalk is free draining. What you want is water in the soil conditions, right. you want, passing through. You want it passing through. Because look, the, the mechanisms for putting heat back into the ground, solar gain, sun comes out, warms the ground. Rainfall, average temperature of rainfall in the southern UK is about 11 degrees or so. So if your ground temperature is only eight degrees and it rains, it warms the yeah. ground up. The third mechanism is migrating groundwater. So water that's moving through, Aquifer. either through the, the surface soil, so floodplain, et cetera, or aquifers, exactly that, deep aquifers, where you've got water moving through fissures in the bedrock. Uh, in London, for example, we've got chalk. Uh, we're looking for fissures in the chalk. The water's moving through that. As you take the heat out, the water comes across the borehole and refreshes that energy supply. So that, that's very good. Okay, I've got one last one. Did you have one? I've, I've got my list. Did you have a, a, a mistake you keep seeing people make? I think the most common thing is that the level of questioning between the consumer and the installer before they start doing anything at all isn't robust enough, which is why the only document that we produce from the Federation's perspective and we make available on our website is a procurement advice document for consumers. And it arms them to with all the questions they should be asking. Yeah. No, well, I mean, obviously, you've got to get the right installer and have the right conversation. Mm. But th these are oversizing, undersizing, wrong kind of sizing of a ground source heat pump outside. These are the kinds of mistakes people make, mispositioning. Um, last one, 
actually, this is not this is not really a heat pump one. Bad thermostat placement. Placing a thermostat near a heat source, like in the sun or in a drafty area, can lead to poor temperature regulation. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? If you yeah, and you're right. That's not a heat pump problem. No, I think the the problem that we have at the moment is that um, we've got very used to fossil fuel boiler systems, which are pretty forgiving. You can get them quite wrong, and yet people will still be warm. They'll still have you know, hot water. The system won't be very efficient, and it might be a bit irritating from a controls perspective, but actually you sort of forgive that because you're warm and the gas is relatively cheap. No one cares too much. Um, heat pump systems are less forgiving. Yeah. So you do have to get more things right in order to ensure that you get the seasonal performance factors that we all you want that we've talked about and we know and love. Um, so you do have to do more things well in order to get a good outcome with a heat pump system than you do with a boiler system. But a lot of that is the planning, installation and design. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that right. the most important thing for a consumer is the choice of the installer. So do your homework, do your due diligence, Use the resources. There are lots of resources available. So things like um, visit a heat pump from uh, Nesta. It's a website. And the Nesta is a charity. They created this. Uh, and people who've had heat pump installations can register their homes uh, and make them available for people. And you, you know, put your postcode in and it comes up with 20 addresses within 10 miles of your house where you can go and look, touch, feel, listen. So it's like try before you buy. Critically, of course, you get to talk to the homeowner who's already had it done. Did your installer do a good job? Are you happy with it? Would you recommend them? Personal recommendations. Yeah. Can't be. No, that's that's Qualifications, good. great. You know, heat key. But personal recommendations, very important. Well, it comes back to installers. And look, if you that's get a heat pump installed, uh, dear listener, then, you know, you could even show other people your heat pump. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Bean, for talking us through some of the errors, half a dozen or so uh, mistakes to avoid in installing a heat pump. And really, it all comes back to just getting the right, getting the right person to do it. If you can, uh, leave us comments, questions. Happy heat pump pod at gmail.com. Happy heat pump pod at gmail.com. Or just leave us comments on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you consume the Happy Heat Pump podcast. Join us again soon.